Okay, so it's um, one minute past um, three o'clock Central European Standard Time. Um, and I'm just seeing participants who are joining us from across Europe. Um, and welcome to this European Federation of Animal Science, a webinar on sustaining human and planetary health through a balanced and omnivorous diet. Um, my name is Michael Lee. I am Deputy Vice Chancellor at Harper Adams University in the UK. And I'm also delighted to be president of the European Federation of Animal Science Livestock Farming Systems Commission um, that are leading the development of this, this webinar uh, today. And huge thank you to the support of EAAP in de delivering this program. We've got a fantastic webinar lined up for you today uh, with three world-renowned speakers. Uh, but if I may, to begin with, before I introduce um, our, our panelists and, and, and speakers, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the European Federation of Animal Science and particularly Livestock Farming Systems Commission. So as you're all aware, EAP is uh, Europe's largest association of animal science, and if, if not actually probably the world's in terms of the last meeting that we had in Lyon, the largest gathering of animal science uh, scientists in the world. Um, and we have our next meeting in Florence um, from the 1st to the 5th of September. Um, and I particularly wanted to draw all the audience's attention to the Livestock Farms Farming System Commission's program for that meeting. So for the last three years, we've worked collaboratively with Animal Task Force, and we have a webinar, a one-day symposium, sorry, a one-day symposium um, uh, set up for the meeting in Florence entitled Livestock are More Than Food, Implementing Livestock-Based Circularities. Um, there are also a whole array of other sessions uh, which I want to draw your attention to if you're developing your abstracts for uh, submission. So Living Labs and Demonstration Farms, and that's joint with the Global Farm Platform. If you're not aware of the Global Farm Platform, please do have a look at the website, um, which is a group of collaborative organizations working to solutions for sustainable ruminant, li uh, ruminant livestock. Um, so we're working in junctions with that in, or with them in on that session. And then we have other sessions, building quality into animal products to improve the sustainability of farming systems uh, for, the, for the future, um, the current and future role of pasture-based production systems and the mitigation and adaptation to climate change impacts on livestock farming systems, technologies for greenhouse gas emission mitigation on farms, options, opportunities, and challenges. And then finally, redesigning the trajectory, the role of resilient livestock farming systems and climate change in relation to feed, livestock effectiveness, and biodiversity. So I think you'd all agree, a fantastic, exciting program for Florence. So please check the EAP website of when abstracts are going to be open and submit those to uh, LFS. I'm sure that you will. So that's enough about Florence um, for today. As I say, we've got a fantastic program. As I said, I'm I'm Michael Lee, and I'm going to just do, do, do a quick introduction, and then I'll hand over to my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Jude Kappa, also of my same uh, university, Harper Adams University, who's going to talk about food production versus environmental provision. A little bit more about that in a moment. Before we hand over to a world-renowned um, expert and friend, Professor Ian Givens from the University of Reading, who will talk about dietary transition from animal to plant-derived foods. Um, and then we'll have a coffee break um, so people can uh, fill up their mugs, take a little bit of a breather, a biological break if you need it. Um, and then before we hand over to Ty Beal, um, who's going to talk about nutritional value score. And I'm sure um, most of you are aware of Ty's fantastic work recently and latest publications, particularly addressing nutritional LCA and functional units. Uh, but um, Ty's got is going to talk about a specific new value score, uh, which we're very interested into. And then we'll have a bit of a wrap up session. So so why why this session? Why did the Livestock Farming System suggest this book, this webinar to the European Federation of Animal Science? Well, there's been a lot of talk about the big concerns regarding livestock and the challenges that they have in terms of human and planetary health. We know there's a global increase in demand for animal source foods. There's a sort of negative pub publicity around some animal source foods in the media, particularly the Western media, I have to say. 
um, and com competition for land um, to, to grow this food and provide other services, be they energy or fiber, um, and of course, delivering to a biodiversity. So pressure on the environment, we very much know it's not just about uh, carbon. There's also nitrogen and phosphorus emissions that we need to be aware of. And the way that we're going to deliver food systems that, that fill in and deliver to circularity. The fact that nutrients aren't waste, they possibly are, could be in the wrong place in space and time, and therefore they need to be circled back into, in, into food use and the role that livestock have in delivering that. So the key question which we hope to discuss for the next few hours is can livestock products be part of the solution? Um, and um, Professor um, uh, Garnsworthy um, spoke about this at BSAS um, um, two years ago now, actually, that, that we often think about um, livestock's role in sustainable food systems, but actually it can be much wider than that and can deliver to a whole array of the sustainable development goals. Livestock can help to address all these goals, especially zero hunger, global health and well-being, uh, responsible consumption and production, climate action, and life on land. But often they're considered in a negative aspect and the anti-livestock agenda would say, and use sustainable development goals against livestock in some key areas. So can they be part of the solution? And that's what we're gonna to tackle today, um, a part of, actually is an omnivorous diet the most sustainable uh, uh, platform for human and planetary health. So first of all, I'm going to hand over to Jude in a moment, who's going to focus on balancing food production and environmental protection. I'm sure we're all very much aware of, of figures like this in high profile publications, uh, which set a uh, sustainability indicator around carbon dioxide equivalents per kilogram of product. Um, and is this a fair reflection of different food types or is this a global misuse of data? Um, and I'll be very interested to hear Jude's viewpoints on that. After Jude, we're going to hand over to Professor Ian Givens, who will address some of the pitfalls of removing animal source foods and often, you know, what is a most sustainable diet in terms of key nutrients needed for human health. And this is some data taken from the National Diet and Nutritional Survey, which looks particularly from the UK, which looks at some of the uh, issues associated with a deficiency in some key nutrients. And we very much look forward to hearing from Ian, an expert um, in this area. Then after our coffee break, we'll hand over to Ty, um, who will talk about the functional units. And actually, if we're looking at food items, we should consider the nutrients they contain. Um, this is an area of very um, topical and an area particularly close to, to my heart because my group and the work that we've been doing has been looking at accounting for nutritional value in functional units, looking at LCA. Um, and there's some analysis and some work that we did at Rothamsted, led by um, a previous postdoc of mine, um, Graham McAuliffe, who's just now moved into industry at, at, at Unilever. And some of the work we did there was looking at saying, actually, if we're going to look at the environment and the impact of food, we should use the correct functional unit, which accounts for their nutritional density. And there's a growing area of interest around nutritional um, LCA. So that gives you a little bit of a flavor of what we're going to hear from in the next uh, couple of hours. Um, just for some, 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 some rules and communication. So after each presentation, there'll be approximately 10 minutes Q and A. You'll see there's a function on Zoom, the Q and A function. So please just access that and type your question in there and I'll keep an eye on that. Um, and then can adjust the questions to the, to the panelists. The webinar will be recorded and will be available on the European Federation of Animal Science website. Um, and please stay tuned for all other webinar series that are going to be available. And in fact, there's a whole suite of these which are available on the website. So Jude, perfectly timed, which means she was listening to me. She wasn't hadn't disappeared, um, but Jude has now turned on her camera. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Jude, and then I'll hand over to you for your presentation. We're very much looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Michael. It's an absolute pleasure to be talking to you all today. And thank you so much for the invitation to speak. 
So you hopefully can see a slide with a part of a Jersey cow on it and a couple of beef animals. Um, let me know if you can't, obviously. But uh, I have to warn you in advance, this is a topic I'm really passionate about. It's something I've been working in the area of for about 16 or so years ago and or so now. And I still believe it's incredibly important. And that is to say the sustainability of livestock products. So a bit of a, a bit of a, a quick tour today of some of what I think are the most important issues when we're faced with challenges, as we all are, about whether we are um, killing the planet as opposed to conserving the planet. So very quick background. My name is Jude Kappa, as uh, Michael has said, and I'm the ABP Chair of Sustainable Beef and Sheep Production at Harper Adams University. So a firm interest in everything sustainability, particularly from um, the grazing ruminant side, which is where I'm going to focus most of my presentation today. There uh, may be one slide on pigs, but otherwise I'm very much going to focus on grazing ruminants, simply because I think that's where we have some of the biggest challenges. But to give you some of the bigger picture, I saw a very um, similar slide to this a few years time and, and a few years ago. And honestly, I didn't believe it. You know, I thought it was complete nonsense. But the thing that is special about this circle is that at the moment, and even more so potentially in the future, there are more people living in the circle that you can see on the screen than in all the rest of the world which completely blows me away. I was literally checking this data two days ago just to make sure that it's still all added up, that there are more people in that circle there than there are in the rest of the world. And I think we all know that we face a considerable challenge. You know, we're going to have more and more people in the next 40 years or so. You can see on this graph the world's population going from 1950 on the left to 2050 on the right, a huge increase in, in people and on average people in um, areas such as India and China and Africa are also going to have more income per capita. And we know that we've seen over time, as people have a greater income per capita, they want more animal source foods. So we really face a huge challenge as an animal industry in producing more food while doing so in an environmentally sustainable way. And accord, uh, according to um, data in the most recent um, meta-analysis paper that I found, we're going to see between a 35% and 56% increase in food production required by the year 2050. So that's a huge quantity more food when, simply put, we don't have any more planet than we do now. You know, So we've got to really focus on improving our sustainability in any way that we can. The problem is that, as Michael referred to earlier, you know, we really face some challenges and I probably spend too much time on social media, if I'm honest. But we see infographics like this one all of the time. So to give you a bit of context, this is from an Instagram account called Simple Happy Kitchen. As you can see, they are very good at marketing and at illustrations that this beautiful little graphic you can see all the different foods there from nuts right at the top to lamb at the bottom this is um apparently kilos of carbon per thousand calories now as a as a as a scientist and a occasional lecturer my biggest issue with this firstly is that there's no citation for this data at the bottom we've got no way of knowing where this has come from Secondly, this is global average data. You know, there is no global average beef. There's no global average cheese. It varies so considerably all across the world. So to pretend that there's a global average any food stuff is really difficult. We could perhaps make the exception for almonds, almost all of which come from California in the States. But for most foods, particularly the animal source foods, there's so much variation across the world that to ascribe a carbon footprint of what you eat for beef or lamb, for example, is simply nonsensical. And it leads the consumer around a really difficult path. And then finally, this is, as you can see, kilos of carbon per thousand calories, which for animal source foods, beef, lamb, tuna, turkey, cheese, is meaningless. We're eating these foods, as will be talked about later, for the high quality protein, vitamins, minerals, essential fatty acids. We're not eating it necessarily for calories. So... As Michael said earlier, we do have a global misuse of data. We have so much information now, which is wonderful, you know, compared 
to when I was a student a number of years ago, you know, now you can get information on almost anything instantly, but that leads to consumer, consumer confusion as well. We don't always have the most accurate, up-to-date scientific information being pushed either to the producer or to the consumer. So as I say, I'm very much focused on sustainability and just so that we're all on the same page, I'm going to give my personal definition, which is that to have a sustainable system, we have to have a balance between environmental responsibility, economic viability and social acceptability, all under the auspices of one health, i.e. again, a balance between animal health, ecosystem health and human health. And that's a huge challenge to balance all of these factors because they change day on day, year and year, according to market and government and resources and climate. These are constantly changing. So sustainability isn't a peak, which we can just conquer. You know, we plant the flag and say, that's it. I am sustainable. It, it's it's a constantly changing set of goalposts, as it were. And that's why as an industry, we've got to work really, really hard because what is sustainable today or tomorrow may not be sustainable next week, next month, next year. But having said that, it is my firm belief that any animal source foods production system can be sustainable and indeed has to demonstrate that it should be sustainable going forward. So to give you some examples, all from the UK, we've got an extensive um, suckler beef system here up in the highlands of Scotland, the, the uh, archetypal highland cow there right in front of you, very much pasture based, low, low, in, low inputs and um, forage based system. Moving on to some stabilizer cattle, this this was at a um, really good farm up in Yorkshire, which for those of you not in the UK is roughly two thirds of the way um, up the UK going north. This was a forage based system again, but then with intensive um, finishing towards the end of these animals lives and then moving to a farm that I work with um, fairly regularly, the ABP research farm um, close to Half Adams University in Shropshire, where we've got some Belgian Blue Cross uh, Jersey um, cattle in an intensive finishing unit. So going in at about six weeks of age, uh, finishing between 16 and 20 months of age. Any of those systems can and should be sustainable if they can balance, as I say, the economics, the environmental and the social aspects as well. But the ways in which we do that vary so considerably. So just as every farm is different, every system is different, the ways that we improve will vary from farm to farm to farm. There really is no one size fits all. No, if you just have this breed, just have this herd size, just use product X, you will be sustainable. There is no one size fits all. It very much depends. To give you um, an example, though, globally, we know that if we improve a productivity, if we meet those key performance indicators, we should reduce environmental impacts in terms of resource use and in terms of the carbon footprint. And this applies to any system, you know, whether it's intensive beef, whether it's housed poultry or a very, very extensive dairy system or pig system across the globe. Anything that we can do in any system to improve by any increment, you know, even if we just improve fertility by 2% or health by half a percent, anything we can do, as I say, in any system, however that applies, will improve productivity, should improve the economics, should improve the social, because then we can demonstrate that we're doing everything that we can to improve and also cut the greenhouse gas emissions, cut the resource use. To give you one example of that, as I say, again, based at the ABP Research Farm, this was some work we conducted just last year, um, funded by the Centre for Innovation and Excellence in Livestock. Um, we looked at modelling the productivity of 777 Angus Cross cattle finished at this farm. Um, we looked at greenhouse gas emissions, we looked at feed intake, we looked at growth rates, and, and we looked at carcass quality as well, both from an economic and a carbon footprint point of view. And what we showed was that finishing at the ideal time, and the emphasis is on ideal, so this wasn't necessarily 
the heaviest weight or the youngest or the oldest, the ideal time and the ideal weight for these cattle, given the market requirements, the economics and the greenhouse gas emissions as well, improve the profit by 45% and cut the carbon footprint by up to 32%. So it's simply about doing everything better on every single farm, which of course seems really easy, doesn't it? You know, just do everything, everything better. But if we can identify the key metrics, the key ways that we do that on every farm across the globe, we can demonstrate sustainability. Another example, as I promised, I do have one slide on pigs. And this is with regards to animal health, you know, we simply don't have all the answers at the moment in terms of how animal health affects sustainability, particularly greenhouse gas emissions and resource use. So as an example, this is some um, um, data we've just got in press at the moment, looking at African swine fever, as well as other diseases that are um, in the full paper. But in terms of the African swine fever, conservative estimates um, site between 100 and 150 million pigs dying. What that loss of productivity resulted in was a 17 to 38% increase in global pork prices. And that's some economics that came from Mason de Croix et al. But the pig meat losses that, that, that would otherwise have come from those pigs that had to be culled or died would have fed between 550 and 824 million people with their annual pig meat demand. That's a huge issue for food security and hunger, which again is part of the sustainable development goals, which Michael alluded to earlier. And then from a greenhouse gas point of view, the resources invested in those animals, which then died or were then culled, were equal to the annual emissions of six of between 16.7 and 25.1 million cars. Again, a huge greenhouse gas impact. So it isn't just about yields or growth rate or carcass weight. It's about health as well. That has huge impacts on overall sustainability. In the UK, we can tend to be fairly UK centric. And uh, somebody asked me a couple of years ago, well, if all cows performed like a UK, UK dairy cow, what could we do in terms of cutting the carbon footprint? Well, according to data from the FAO, the global average yield for a dairy cow, if there is a average cow, would be 2,577 kilos of milk. Whereas the UK average yield, um, based on data from last year, is just over 8,000 kilos of milk. So if we could improve the performance of every single cow in the world to perform like the UK cow, we could produce the same amount of milk using 69% fewer cows or 181 million fewer cows. If we improved still further and went fairly intensive to US average yields, we could do the same with 75% fewer cows or 200 million. So these are huge increases. But of course, the automatic um, response to that is, do we want to all go intensive? You know, do do does every dairy system um, have the ability and the capacity to do that? And the answer, of course, is no. You know, we have billions of systems across the world, which are very extensive. It's not about going intensive, intensive, intensive housed high input. It's simply about improving every system. So even in a three cow operation in Kenya, for example, we can put in place practices and systems to improve productivity, to cut resource use, to cut the carbon footprint. But it goes further than that. We've really got to think when we talk about sustainability it's not just about environment and it's not just about greenhouse gas emissions we've got to look at all of the benefits in terms of these metrics so we've got to think about the benefits in terms of nutrition which i know that ian and ty are going to talk about later but we've got to also think about fertilizer we've got to think about draft power cultural status education you know all of these true and obvious benefits that we get from livestock but both in Europe and across the world have somehow got to be factored in. And that's a really big challenge, because when we talk to people outside agriculture, we've got to help them understand that having healthy diets, healthy planet and healthy animals isn't just about carbon. It's not just about greenhouse gas emissions. So we've got to look wider. 
In the beef industry, for example, we face a particular challenge here in the UK and across the world. Not surprisingly, processors and retailers have grown to understand that if they want to cut their scope three greenhouse gas emissions, um, given that dairy beef or beef that comes from the dairy herd has a carbon footprint about half that of suckler beef in the UK or cow calf beef in the States, for example, the suckler industry or the more extensive beef industry has to um, step up in talking about the ecosystem benefits of their industry. About 50% of our beef in the UK comes from suckler cows, but each of those cows is going to eat just under 4,000 kilos of feed trimatter per year. She's going to consume about 20,000 litres of water and she's going to emit just under two and a half tonnes of carbon dioxide and all of those impacts have to be justified we've got to talk about the wider positives of grazing ruminants in 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 terms of ecosystem sustainability because again we face some real challenges this is an infographic that i saw years ago now and i've been using it ever since but we see these type of things all the time you know we use too much land we use too much feed feed efficiency is really poor compared just to people eating that grain or um, eating that um, feed that we inst instead feed to livestock. And here again, there's a common misperception that, of course, we can eat everything that we feed to livestock. I would hope that all of us know on this call that we can't, but to the consumer, it's a different story. So, for example, there was some really nice work came out from Mike Wilkinson back in 2011 now. He, he's the title of his paper being about redefining feed efficiency. These are the traditional ratios that we see when we talk about feed efficiency. So, for example, dairy in the UK has an average feed efficiency of 1.1 kilos of feed per kilo of output, i.e. milk, cereal beef at 7.8, poultry and eggs around two. The suckler cow looks really, really poor. Look, you know, 27 kilos of feed per kilo of output on a feed in output out basis. But again, we've got to have better metrics. We've got to have more appropriate metrics. So what Wilkinson did, which was really interesting, was to look not just at kilos of feed in, kilos of output out, but kilos of human edible protein in the livestock diet versus kilos of human edible protein coming out in terms of milk, meat and eggs. And then we see a very different picture because you can see that in the UK for dairy and for suckler beef, primarily because of their forage based diet, but also because of the high use of byproducts from human food and fiber production in their diets, both dairy and suckler beef produce more human edible protein than they consume. They are not competing with humans for feed versus food, but that's a complex message to convey to consumers, to people that don't have the time, frankly, to understand, to read and to listen. So we've got to be better at the messaging and helping people to understand the benefits. I've been very lucky over the last 15 years ago um, to travel all over the world. So this is a picture from South Africa. We were traveling between conferences. Um, as you can see here, there's a huge hill there with a few bits of tree on it, very rocky, very arid. You've got a couple of tiny little homes and farms in front. And what you can't see in this picture is the single goat that was sitting in the middle of the road. You know, to people, they often think, well, land is land is land. We can grow food everywhere, right? There was one goat on all of this land because it's poor quality it's arid, it's infertile, it, it gives us really poor quality grass, which can only support one single goat. I was very lucky to live in Montana in the States for two and a half years. Beautiful place, you know, gorgeous countryside, big mountains, ice on the top, it's lovely. But in the summer, it's really, really, really dry. And for most of the year, it's covered in snow. Um, there was one year when I was there when it snowed in June, which seems to be crazy. So we have a cow calf op operation here, Angus cattle. As you can see, the stocking rates in Montana on average, 10 hectares per cow, which seems entirely mad, doesn't it? You know, that sounds crazy, but 10 hectares per cow because that land is 
is so relatively unproductive. We can't grow grain there. We can't grow apples and quinoa there. The best use of that land is for grazing ruminants. And coming back to the UK here, there's some um, sheep here, obviously. Um, this was up in um, the middle of Scotland. Um, for those of you who don't know, Scotland, up at the north of England, 89% um, of the land in Scotland cannot effectively be used for anything but pasture because it's too high, too low, too wet, too dry, too rocky, too steep. You know, we can't grow um, food on every part of land in the world on an arable basis. But of course, we can if we put that land into pasture and add some grazing ruminants. But again, we face challenges. We see data every single day that says between 60 and 75 percent of our global agricultural land is used for livestock. And people go, whoa, that's far too high. We can't do that. That's madness. But we've got to partition out grazing land that we can't use for anything else versus arable land. This was um, done in a really nice review paper from Mike Wilkinson and the chair of this uh, webinar. Michael Lee came out in 2018 now. Not dissimilar to Mike Wilkinson's similar work, which I just referred to on redefining feed efficiency. We're here looking at land use in terms of hectares per tonne of protein. As you can see, um, not dissimilar to the previous results, you know, upland and lowland beef and lamb look pretty horrendous compared to cereal, beef, poultry, eggs and pork. You know, they've got um, values for land use per tonne of protein going from about 17 hectares up to uh, 28 hectares, you know, really high compared to all of the other livestock species. But again, this doesn't partition out grazing land versus arable. And if we do that, as they did in this paper, we see a very different pattern. So the green bars are grassland, the yellow bars are arable land. And if we split it still further to allow for scale, you can see that there's a real place for grazing ruminants. So the grazed dairy cattle, upland beef and lamb and lowland beef and lamb, all using far less arable land per tonne of protein produced than poultry, eggs and pork. Now, this is not to say in any way that we shouldn't have poultry, eggs and pork, but in, in general, the livestock species that have been most vilified in the media tend to be grazing ruminants. And we just need better metrics, better data and better ways to communicate with the consumer about these benefits to help them understand that we can have all of these animal source foods without killing the planet. So finally, again, moving beyond greenhouse gas emissions, there were some initiatives in the North um, Highlands of Scotland about 20 years ago now to improve the land, improve in quote marks, by planting trees and taking cattle and sheep off the land, which seems like a no-brainer to some, of course, you know, but in essence, it has really negative effects on biodiversity, because in this area, there's a lot of ground nesting birds. Firstly, if you plant trees in an area with a lot of ground nesting birds, they tend to associate tr trees with predators. So the closer they are to trees, the further they're going to try to move away to nest. Secondly, if we take the cattle and sheep off this land, once the grass gets above 15 centimetres high, that's too high for those birds to nest. So you have trees, which is a negative for the birds because of predators, and they can't nest because the grass gets too long, so the birds fly away. Fairly obviously, if we don't have any cattle or sheep, we don't have any dung. And behold, the mighty dung beetle, which has so many benefits in terms of soil quality and soil health and carbon, but also gives us larvae, which feed the ground nesting birds. So we take the cattle off. We then don't have the dung. We don't have the dung beetle. We don't have the soil quality. We don't have the soil carbon. And we don't have biodiversity in terms of the ground nesting birds. You know, we've got to think wider than just carbon, but cattle and sheep as well give us some really positive benefits in terms of the ecosystem all across the world. And we've got to have better data talking about that because soil, of course, is absolutely crucial. And almost all of our food comes ultimately from the soil, the exception on this picture being the uh, fish pie on the right hand side. But of course, fish in itself and aquaculture, again, being directly affected by soil quality and soil health. So we've got to think about all of these aspects. It's not just as simple as animal source foods 
carbon footprint, we've got to think bigger all across the all across the globe. So with that, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. I'm happy to answer any questions. You've also got my email address here. If we've got time, happy to answer questions and uh, looking forward to the wrap up at the end as well. So thank you so much. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Jude. That was a real tour de force as I knew it would be. Um, please can I encourage people um, to write their questions in the Q&A um, and they can be directed at Jude. I think we have got time for a couple of questions, uh, Jude, if that's okay, before we hand over to, to Ian. And if Ian has any questions as well, of course, you, you can uh, just ra ra raise your hand. Um, you gave a really good example, Jude, of, of a farm which showed a 32% reduction in carbon by doing things better. How much of that reduction in carbon was driven purely by um, um, finishing those animals earlier, as opposed to reducing enteric fermentation or impact on carbon sequestration and offsetting? So is the game about finishing animals earlier? Really good question. In that example, almost all of it was simply finishing animals earlier, um, simply because we didn't measure the impacts on other factors. But I mean, carbon sequestration, depending on the farm, I have some farmers who will tell me that they are already carbon positive and I go, well, it depends which tool you use and who calculated it, et cetera, has a huge role to play. Methane inhibitors um, are going to be really important, I think. The challenge is at the moment, how do we apply them in the more extensive systems? It's very easy in an intensive house type system, obviously, extensive systems are going to be more tricky but it really is just doing everything better you know better health better feed efficiency better choice of feeds you know all of these things play a part so in that example it was ideal age at slaughter and i should emphasize ideal it isn't always younger but ideal age at slaughter and i should emphasize as well that's at a really good farm so, yeah. I mean, I've seen farms where the age of slaughter is far higher, even in an intensive type system. So we've got real opportunities. We just need to identify them. Yeah, that, that's great. Thanks, Jude. And you, you did a real good job of emphasising, which is critical, of course, when we think about sustainability, um, that it's not just carbon. You mentioned about arable land use, you know, about, you know, um, our work um, uh, associated with that. You also talked about a whole array of other services particularly if you're thinking about smallholder of farmers um that livestock to deliver but how do we include this in a metric because as we know we're killed by simplicity of metrics mm -hmm. um and carbon dioxide equivalents per kilogram of product is a very easy to use metrics easy to predict there's algorithms associated with it um and there's the old argument um easy but wrong and um, people follow and uh, difficult but right and people go actually mm. so how do we start to encapsulate some of these more complex um indicators in into metrics it is really really difficult i think there's two things we've got to do firstly we've got to make the measurement easier so i would give a shout out for example to the um merlin app which is one where you can record bird song on your phone farmers can use it while they're feeding their cattle or moving fences or whatever it might be and it'll give them a record and therefore a baseline and a metric for all the birds on their farm you know it's simple it's easy it's quick anyone can do it so we need simple measurements first the metric bit becomes more difficult because we often see trade-offs. So the classic one would be the perceived welfare of cattle out on pasture is perceived to be better than in a house system, but that can often go counter to the carbon footprint. So we've got to have more metrics almost and have like a suite of metrics because if we try to combine them, the positives outweigh the negatives and, and everyone tends to come towards the mean. So we've got to have a, a whole suite. Um, and there are... Um, apps and tools thinking about um doing that now but we've just got to have the most importantly i think is how do we measure it in the first place because if we can't measure it then it doesn't matter what the metric is we're going to end up with um data that doesn't make sense that's great i i, I noticed that there's questions coming in 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 the in the chat um if q a if the q a function in your system isn't working then please do the do the chat 
Um, so so we, we can harness those. I, I'm, I know we're up at time, but I'm, go, I'm just going to fire this question on from uh, Hans Van Dam, if that's OK, Jude, uh, before mm -hmm. we go to Ian. I know Ian's keen to, to get mm -hmm. in. Um, if, is he, he asked the question, if we eventually are to get to global zero greenhouse gases, what would be the argument to completely remove animal production um, because of their impact on biogenic um, methane, be it through enteric fermentation, manure and, and nitrous oxide? Great question. Subject of the whole talk or talks in itself, I think. Um, and there's a lot of debate about what we leave in, what we leave out. For example, most of the tools and most of the assessments at the moment don't leave in, don't include carbon sequestration because we don't have good data. Um, the fact that we do have this biogenic carbon system leads some people to say we shouldn't count animals at all, whereas I would counter that we have to include everything. Um, and there's also, of course, a question over metrics, which was alluded to earlier, you know, G GWP 100 versus GWP star. I think, honestly, we have to put in everything that we can so that we are a being accurate, B, being scientific, and C, being conservative before we take stuff out. And I think we are, it's a bit dangerous when we start saying, well, we don't have to consider this and we don't have to consider that because, you know, if we are transparent about what we do, we can show greater gains than if we try to leave things out of the calculations. But as I say, that's a whole, that's a whole thing that we could talk about for hours. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Jude. So I'll, I'll allow I'll allow you to go and come back for the panel discussion later. Thank you very much again, Jude. I'll allow Ian to to put up his slides. Um, you know, also, I, I would add the comment, of course, that it, it is about um, about net zero uh, when we think about livestock production systems. So we need to consider the wider auspices of the production system and uh, not just the emissions from the animal. You know, so we do need to consider soil health. Uh, NPP um, and sequestration as part of the wider system. But we'll come back back to the discussion. Thank you very much for the question. And please do add more questions to the chat. So without any more ado, I'll hand over to Professor Ian Givens, uh, an individual that's um, had a huge impact on my career in terms of the work that he's done over many, many years. I always enjoy listening to, to Ian. And Ian, um, over to you for, for your presentation. Very much looking forward to it. Thank you very much, Michael. For those kind words. I didn't realize I had such an impact on anybody. <laughs> it's quite nice to hear. Um, afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and to, to talk to you this afternoon. Um, I'm Ian Givens, as you've heard. I'm the director from the Institute for Food, Nutrition and Health in the University of Reading in the UK. And this afternoon, I'm going to talk about what it says on the screen, really, the, the effects, really, or the, the, the risks associated with dietary transition from animal to plant derived foods. Um, and whether there are benefits and and uh, and risks, of course. So we are talking about dietary transition broadly from from animal derived foods on the left to uh, plant derived foods on the right, and and as we've heard already this afternoon, you know the this transition is reported at least to have benefits for the environment, benefits for health possibly. And I'm, I'm told that there are benefits to the animals involved as well. They apparently will feel better if we have less of them to be used. What, I've, what I think is, is also true, that when we hear all about this in the media, we always hear about protein transition. And I think this is wrong. Um, people tend to forget that if you, if you change the source of protein, you're almost certainly going to change other nutrients as well. Uh, but but that's what we hear, and I think it's just too simplistic and, and, and not actually very correct. I think another thing we need to do is, what, you know, it, I guess in life, really, when we start, when we want to plan anything to, to do, anything, any changes or any places we want to go to, we really should know what our starting position is, because that will inform us about what we can do and what we can achieve or what we shouldn't do as well. And I think the first thing, uh, you know, that we realize, and I think I think Michael said this at the very outset, that simple protein replacement is not simple. Animal derived foods themselves are highly variable. You know, they have different nutrient profiles, different functionalities, and different impacts on health, which we'll have a little bit of a look at uh, in, in a few minutes. So it, it isn't simple. One of the things that we also know is that Simply replacing protein doesn't answer all the or answer all the questions because 
we have to consider protein quality. Protein, all protein is not of the same quality. Generally speaking, as you can see on the right here, most of the animal derived proteins are of higher quality than plant derived proteins. Not all of them, but, but most of them. And, and also nowadays we're becoming more interested in the, the so-called leucine amino acid ratio because of the fact that leucine is an unusual, it's one of the branched chain amino acids, but it has unusual functionality. It, it actually has anabolic effects in certain ways, which I'm not going to say any more about, but it, it, they are important, potentially very important. So we're more interested in that as well now. The other thing we know is broadly anyway, we know what the dietary sources of protein in the UK diet are. Um, and you can see here, I've just given a sort of list of, of three different age groups, children, uh, adolescents and, and adults. And you can see that they're broadly similar, although there are slight differences between the different age groups, as you would expect. But overall, when you look at it like this, the biggest single source of protein is in fact, is indeed animal derived foods, meat, milk, eggs, fish, etc. And I think as far as this afternoon's concerned, you could you'll maybe just accept my word for it, that dairy products in general are not associated with increased risk of cardiometabolic diseases or, or other diet responsive diseases that we're interested in. White meat similarly is pretty neutral uh, in, in these regards as well. But there are concerns, as I'm sure you know, about red and particularly processed meat. So we know these things, and I think we know we should we should use this information in, in determining how we how we go about changing things. So let, let's have a look at some of the issues around meat. And it's really what I said a second ago. If you look in the center, unprocessed poultry meat, and this is a, a paper we published last year, but it, it's actually, uh, if you like, a summary of meta-analyses. So these are not individual studies. Um, and in this particular case, there's three studies involved in the meta-analysis, but you can see that unprocessed poultry meat was associated with a slight reduction in risk of stroke, more or less what I said a minute ago. If we then look at, at red meat, you can see that things change a little bit. There is generally a slight increased risk associated with red meat. If you take the, the one in the center, high versus low uh, intake in relation to stroke outcome, which had six meta-analyses in it, um, you can see that the risk has increased by about 10, just over 10%. And similarly, in the dose response studies, um, significantly higher than one, but not much. So red meat is just on the edge, if you like, in, in terms of cardiovascular diseases, risk associated with that. Processed meat, on the other hand, is somewhat different. You can see that for most of the studies here, if you just take the second one down per 50 a dose response meta-analysis per 50 grams of processed meat per day, the risk of heart disease, ischemic heart disease, increases by about 27%. And some of them are about 17, et cetera. So again, processed meat, uh, if you like, moves the scale up a bit even further. The problem is, of course, define, defining what processed meat is um, and, and what in it that is the problem. The other area which we're obviously concerned about is the, is the association between diet and colorectal cancer. It's, it's, the, it's the most important cancer, if you like, that affects both men and women. And these are data from the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute for Cancer Research reports. They, they produce um, reports every now and again when there's new information. This is actually the most recent one, and I guess um, there must be one due fairly soon. But the, the main thing I just wanted to, to, to highlight was that if you look at dairy products in relation to colorectal cancer, the, the report says that the evidence is quite strong and it is probable that dairy products decrease the risk of colorectal cancer. And I think, you know, we're beginning now to understand the mechanisms, why, why that might be the case. And, and actually the supply of calcium from dairy foods is one of the, one of the key things that seems to be involved. On the other hand, if you look at red meat, the, the reckoning is there that the red meat probably increases the risk of colorectal cancer. But then when you look at processed meat, the evidence, according to the report, is convincing. And I think, again, the, the evidence for processed meat 
has increased, you know, over the last sort of five to 10 years, the evidence has gone to become stronger. It still relates, of course, to trying to understand what processed meat is and what is it about processed meat that increases the risk. This is a much more recent study published, um, I thought it was last year actually, but it was the year before last. This is looking at the association between meat consumption and the risk of, of dementia. And this is a significant study because for many years now, many of the studies with processed meat has been from the States and other parts of the world. And people here have said, well, yeah, but of course in the States, the processed meat's different to here. So we can't apply, you know, we can't look at the evidence there and apply it here. We can't, we don't have an excuse with this particular study. This is study, this is data from the, the UK Biobank, um, almost half a million subjects in the study. And the food is what people in the UK have been eating. And you can see that on the right-hand side that again, the issue of processed meat stands out. Processed meat increased the risk by about 50% per 25 grams per day. Unprocessed poultry meat was neutral. And interestingly, in this particular study, unprocessed red meat was associated with a reduced risk of, this is Alzheimer's disease, but total dementia is more or less the same because Alzheimer's is about 90% of total dementia anyway. Um, and importantly too, there was the results were completely independent of the apoe 4 allele. This is a particular um, gene variant that increases the risk of uh, dementia very substantially. It actually increases the risk of cardiovascular disease as well. Um, but, but anyway, it was in this, these data are independent of the effect of that and stands out again as being an issue with processed meat. And this is UK processed meat. This is a slightly different angle. This is the issue of dietary fiber. Dietary fiber, again, the evidence for dietary fiber in relation to um, colorectal cancer is also pretty strong. The target in the UK for um, dietary fiber is 30 grams per day, which would be 100% on this scale. And you can see that none of the, uh, none of the uh, age groups that we've got on there get anywhere near 20%. So there's, there's a massive gap there in terms of dietary fiber. And I just think that um, for, if for no other reason than this, we need to increase, increase the proportion of plant material in the diet, because we, we, we as, as I say, we don't achieve anywhere near the target for dietary fiber. And really the only main, the main source of dietary fiber really is plant material. <clears throat> I think Michael showed a little bit about this at the very beginning. Um, Animal derived foods do provide a range of really key and important nutrients. And that I think is often lost in, in, the, uh, in the overall story. This little picture down here is meant to show a group of adolescent females because adolescent females are the big worry, <laughs> if you like. This is a slightly different variation on the, I think the slide Michael showed uh, at the beginning or near the beginning. This represents the suboptimal micronutrient intake of UK female adolescents, the dark red, and in adult females, at least up to 64 years of age, uh, females in the slightly um, pinky color. And this is, represents the percentage of these populations that are consuming less than the lower reference nutrient intake. Just for those that may be unclear, reference nutrient intakes in the UK are set at an, an, an allowance which represents the requirements of 97.5% of the population, so most of the population, um, and higher than average, of course, of the population. The lower reference nutrient intake only represents the requirements of the bottom 2.5% of the population. So you see we have about 55% of adolescent females that are consuming less than the lower reference nutrient intake for iron, Adult females about 30%, calcium uh, about 30, about well, 25% in, in adolescents. Magnesium is a real worry um, and, and, and an increasing worry for reasons I'll perhaps mention in a, in a while, but we have about 50% less than the lower reference to genetic for magnesium. Uh, zinc about 30%, selenium about 45%, and iodine about 30%. And, and the significance of these nutrients is that they, for, for many people, they provide 
uh, sorry, for many people, it's animal derived foods that provide most of the most of these nutrients. You know, red meat's a key source of iron, milk a key source of, of calcium, and a key source of iodine, etc. But this just illustrates, I think, what Michael was saying earlier, that we have we have a problem in this area, and I think we really need to to recognize that and you know use the information that we know about this in terms of how we plan future dietary transition. The other thing we need to bear in mind is, as well is that generally speaking, micronutrients supplied by plant material has low bioavail lower bioavailability than it does from animal derived foods. This is a fairly, well, it goes back a few years, this study, but it just shows the difference between omnivorous diets and vegetarian diets when the intake of iron and zinc are more or less the same. And you can see the differences that that is translates into in terms of bioavailability of iron, very much higher in, um, in omnivorous diet because quite a bit of that iron in there will be coming from as heme iron from from predominantly from red meat which has a very high bioavailability compared to non-heme iron zinc not quite such a difference but still substantial difference uh, to in favor of uh, omnivorous diets which again some of that zinc will be from will be from meat so it's not just a question of simply replacing Micronutrients on a gram for gram basis, if you like, you have to bear in mind that the bioavailability of them will be different. The, the other big concern, I think, at the minute, relating to what we've just seen, is the effect that this, is, this potentially has on bone health. I think people often forget that it's really the teenage years between about sort of 10, 11, and 18 to 20, where the biggest increase in bone mass occurs. And the problem is that if you don't get an adequate bone mass developed in that period, you increase the risk, as you see here in the suboptimal, what they call lifestyle factors, which means diet really. Um, if you don't achieve a high peak bone mass, you then are in much greater risk of low bone density, low bone mineral density in later life, and a greater risk of osteoporosis and weaker bones basically. And of course, the weaker, weaker bones increases the risk of, of bone breakage, particularly if some elderly people have falls, etc. And that can have a massive effect on, on their life quality. I mentioned magnesium before, and you can see this little skeleton is worrying about magnesium, and he's worrying about it because he knows, like we do now, that in fact magnesium, although magnesium content of bone is a lot less than calcium, magnesium seems to have a, a slightly additional effect in terms of stimulating bone mineralization um, and bearing that in mind you know we had about 50 percent of the of the of adolescents that are not achieving anywhere near the the, the need the, the requirements for bone uh, for, for magnesium intake and so there is a risk i think um attached to that particularly and you can see some of the consequences of this there are, there are two or three studies like this now but this is um this is one from 2019, a meta-analysis of the effects of vegetarian and vegan diets on bone mineral density. Bone mineral density at the femoral neck, this, this very top part of the femur. Um, and that, that particular joint there, if you like, su supports quite a lot of the body weight of an individual and has a, has a higher risk of breaking if, if there's bone weakness. And you can see that when they looked at, when they compared the um, bone mineral density at that point in vegetarian and vegans, it was significantly less than in omnivores, quite a bit less actually. Um, and, and I guess you can understand why that might be. When they tried to compare the differences between uh, the vegans and the vegetarians, there wasn't so much difference as you might think. Vegans had a, there was a tendency for vegans to have less uh, bone mineral density at the femoral neck than, vegan, than vegetarians, but it wasn't, I think it was quite significant. But this, as I say, there are other studies very similar to this, which show more or less the same thing. And it's just telling you really that vegetarian and vegan diets just in, have an increased risk of, of this in relation to um, bone, bone, uh, bone strength, really. I think we also need to remember that there are micronutrients that plants simply cannot supply, no matter how hard they might try, they simply can't. Uh, it's, it's, I've just highlighted here vitamin B12 and vitamin D. There are other nutrients as well, but these are perhaps in some ways some of the, some of the ones that have a, the biggest risk attached to them. 
In terms of vitamin B12, <clears throat> the population as a whole is not too bad in terms of status, but you can see where most of the vitamin B12 comes from, on average, comes from dairy, meat, and fish. And so if you begin to move away from these products, then that does then increase the risk of vitamin B12 status not being optimal. And this is particularly important for the elderly. Generally speaking, as people, uh, people age, they, uh, their efficiency of absorbing vitamin B12 um, from, the, from the duodenum decreases. And um, <clears throat> they generally need to consume more of it in order, in order to get the, um, the same amount absorbed, if you like. So I think that's a bit of a, potentially a bit of a worry. Uh, vitamin D is also a big worry. As a population, not just in the UK, a population across Europe, actually, um, we are generally very marginal in terms of vitamin D status. And some sections of the population, particularly some of the ethnic minority groups, are even very much lower in vitamin D status than that. It's actually quite interesting, too. That we, we have quite a bit of work in India at the minute. And... Um, <clears throat> You might not think that Indians would have a problem with vitamin D status given the amount of sun that they have, but they do. In fact, a few years ago, India was regarded as the most vitamin D deficient country in the world. And there are reasons for it, but it, um, it is counterintuitive to many. Now, vitamin, D, <coughs> vitamin D supply in the UK through diet is pretty poor. Um, the daily recommended intake of vitamin D for everybody is 10 micrograms per day. Um, diet only provides about two to three micrograms per day. And, you know, you really just have to come to the conclusion that I think everybody should be taking supplemental vitamin D. There's really not much doubt about that. Having said that, though, if you look at the, the dietary supply of vitamin D, although it's not much, but what there is tends to come from meat eggs and fish dairy is very little and so again if you move people away from these foods and you don't then accept you know if they don't recognize that they have to take supplementary vitamin d which they probably should do anyway but it's just going to make that situation somewhat worse and when and, and i think the thing about vitamin d which is perhaps not always appreciated is that we've known for years and years that vitamin d is involved in um absorption of calcium and, and important in terms of bone development, et cetera. But vitamin D has many more, um, many more functions in that. And we're, we're now pretty confident of its function within the immune system, for example. Uh, and we have a study looking at that at the minute. So it's a big issue. And so what do we know about our starting position? Well, I think we've, you know, we know quite a lot and I think that should inform what we do. And we should take a we should recognize that it's not a simple thing to to make this transition. And I think we just need to also think about whether all plant all plant based diets are they always healthier? You can probably guess what the answer is going to be. But this was quite an interesting study published last year, <clears throat> where the uh, the group involved developed what they call plant based diet indices. And basically, they developed what they called a healthy plant diet index and an unhealthy plant diet, plant diet index. And in this particular part of what they did, they looked at the association between uh, between increasing these and the um, association with overall mortality, all cause mortality. And you can see the healthy plant diet index, after a little while anyway, the association with mortality started to decline, whereas the unhealthy plant diet index increased pretty quickly, really, um, the association with, with mortality. And you might say, well, why was that? And the answer is, in some ways, fairly obvious in, in a way. The, the foods that were in the healthy plant food category, you can see there was a lot of vegetables, legumes, fruit. In the unhealthy part of that category, there was much less vegetables, much less fruit. And then in the less healthy plant uh, derived foods in the high index or higher index was fruit, fruit juices, some potatoes. But the unhealthy one, you can see what most of the problem is, refined grains, but also a high contribution of sugar sweetened drinks. And, and of course, I think people tend to forget that sugar tends to come from plants. And that's one of the key reasons that why this uh, unhealthy plant index um, 
you know, was shown to be the case because of that. They also actually had some animal derived foods in both the healthy and the unhealthy index. Um, and dairy was actually the highest in the, in the healthy index. Uh, and meat was the highest in the unhealthy index. It didn't define different types of meat from memory. But nevertheless, it just makes the point that, you know, plant based diets don't necessarily always provide the best nutrition and not, not, not automatically always more healthy. So I thought I would just finish with a quick look at the diet, which has probably had most of the, well, it certainly had a lot of publicity in the last couple of years, um, the Eat Lancer diet. It's kind of what you would expect in many ways. They, they, they've kind of categorized foods into three categories, foods that they think should be emphasized, the green, um, the green stars you see in here, what they call optional foods, which includes um chicken poultry meat eggs and dairy foods although they do, they do you know offer them as an option if you like if you like and there's the things that they should have the people should have very limited intake of and you can probably guess some of them added sugars but also in bought beef lamb and pork in other words red meat and highly fairly processed uh, starchy products as well so in a sense, you know, that's what you'd maybe you say, well, that's what you'd expect. And incidentally, this diet that they've constructed here only provides about 8.6 megajoules per day, which is pretty low, certainly low for an adult. And um, maybe this is part of their campaign to try and make people slimmer. It's, it, it probably would do that for a lot of people. And I thought it was interesting um, to look at that quickly. Also to, to, to show you something which I mentioned earlier, I think, this actually is a slide from one of the papers of the next speaker and i hadn't realized that that was the case when i sought it but it gives a gives perhaps gives quite a nice link uh, to the next talk and th they've looked here at the micronutrient what they've called shortfalls in the eat lancer diet planetary health diet and you can see that the things that they've come up with relate to vitamin b12 calcium iron and zinc most of the most of the nutrients there that we've talked about earlier so I think it's quite interesting, you know, to see that because it does highlight that a diet of this type may not necessarily be exactly everything that we want. There may still be things that it needs, you know, needs to do. So I'm conscious that my time's up. Um, I'll just leave you with a few final thoughts, which are more or less what I've just said. I think all plant-based diets are not, not automatically healthy and they do not automatically provide sustainable nutrition, but they do need planning carefully, like all diets do. There is, I think, good evidence that increased plant-based foods in the UK diets are, are, are definitely needed, at least for dietary fiber. And I think good evidence that increased risk if more animal-derived foods are excluded from diets, particularly of female adolescents and women of childbearing age, especially if they're replaced by refined carbohydrates, which has to some extent happened. Processed meat consumption, I think, should be a reduction target. The protein that it does supply could be replaced by plants, and actually, in some cases, probably doesn't need to be replaced at all. And then finally, really, are all plant-based foods more environmentally friendly and sustainable than animal-based foods? And that's not to me to answer, but it's a question I think that uh, we'll, we, we are going to talk about more today than we already have. And I just think, as I think Michael said earlier, that the comparison should include nutrition health, not simply per kilogram of, of, of product. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Thank you, Ian. Um, everything we expected it to be, so th thank you again. Um, there, there is a, a question um, in, in the chat, and I, I, I've got a few as, as well. Please, can I encourage individuals to to write their questions in in the chat or the q and a um in fact bill bill gray uh, grayson's figured out how to use the q and a system um and when you put up your slide um regarding vitamin b12 and d provision um you mentioned meat and and bill was saying does that include red and white meat and does it include also processed meat because you've talked about the negative aspects of processed meats being a rising risk for 
cardiovascular disease and some cancers, but actually look at the risk ratio. We all know that a bigger risk is alcohol, but we all like to drink alcohol. Um, so is there benefits of processed meats? Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm honest, I'm not absolutely sure. It's it's whatever the NDA, it's whatever the National Diet and Nutrition Survey called meat when it calculated that. So I, I guess it will include some processed meat. I mean, processed meat is often certainly, you know, processed meat is often not what people think it is. It means bacon, sausages are processed meat. They, and they for sure will have gone into that category for, for vitamin D. Yeah, I'm sure that I'm sure that's the case. And, and, and I like the discussion that we've had before, Ian, and I know there was a proposal that we we're working on with Socrates on the fact that actually just calling processed meat is, is, is not helpful because there's such wide range. You, uh, as you said, you could call minced beef processed. Yeah, it's absolutely. It's processed, but absolutely. It, it, it's, it hasn't added salt and sugars and et cetera to, to that. Yeah, and the other thing about it as well, I mean, some of the issues that... That, that occur is occur because of the heating processes that, that take place as well and you know how you how you resolve all that i don't i don't know but i think i think i think we have to do something about process meat because of the the, the the weight of you know the weight of evidence um I, I mean one of the things we've been kind of talking about which we've not to be honest not done anything about it um particularly in relation to in, in, in the colorectal cancer you know nobody knows whether you know different cuts of meat different breeds of meat if that's the right word mm. uh, you know whether they have different impacts i mean there's no doubt that the, the, the heme component of, of red meat and to some extent processed meat is is a key factor but there's other things as well um, and, I, and i do think that's something that could be not simply done, but I think it's something that, sh that should be done to try and differentiate, you know, the risks associated with different types of red meat and processed meat. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Bill's just added another comment um, in, in, in the Q&A, uh, which is basically to start to define about ultra processed products, because, <laughs> of course, plant based ultra processed products yeah. are, are can be detrimental to health as much as yeah. animal ultra processed products. Yeah. Yes. And you can argue that sugar is ultra processed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And and given, and there's been a lot of meta-analyses, and thank you, Ian, again, you, you summarised them so well. Uh, but, you know, wh when you put up the, the, the risk of particularly colorectal cancer and red meat, as opposed to processed meat, the even though there is this new, new uh, slight increase, the evidence is weak. Um, and it's clear and all, all you know, some really high level um, uh, meta analyses have now said, actually, this is a weak association. And and actually, it's 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 so weak. Actually, the, the recommendations for reductions of red meat when we have a populations of lower iron intake. Could be argued actually to be inappropriate. Because if you've got one area where you've got very, very weak association with a, a risk, but a clear association associated with the iron efficient um, uh, bioavailability. Um, so, so what do you think about the, the, the recommendations from the WHO associated with well, I mean, with I think meat as opposed to process? I think what you said is, 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 is right. I mean, one of the interesting things is that everybody says that, and, and they're right, that in the, in the hierarchy of evidence, you know, results from randomized control trials are, if you like, much more, much more beneficial, if you like, because they're looking at cause and effect, whereas most of the other evidence from cohort studies, you're looking at associations and you, and you can't infer causality, generally speaking. All of the recommendations we have nowadays for dietary in, in dietary um, guidelines in relation to cancer are all based on long-term prospective studies. So by definition, this, the, the strength of evidence isn't as strong as some of the other, other types of studies. But you know, you've also got to recognize that it would be really difficult to have long-term randomized control trials to do that sort of study. You would never, you'd never do it and it would just be too expensive anyway. So you've got to find a balance between the two. And I, and I think, I think to be fair to the World Cancer Research Fund, you know, they've tried to find some sort of balance. If you look at some of the words they use in the, in the recommendations, they're a bit woolly sometimes because mm -hmm. of that. Um, and, and I think you're, um, 
what, what you're saying about alcohol is quite interesting because the the risk of of uh, the, the cancer risk associated with alcohol is significantly higher than that than it is from from red mm. meat, yeah. and you never hear any you never hear any sort of uh, cries from the world uh, of the media or from the population that you know we should be closing distilleries and closing breweries and stop producing them, and yet you know you could argue that would make a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. If you're just making the consider of what you put into your mouth based yeah, on that risk exactly. factor of cancer, then you certainly right. won't be drinking alcohol. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah. but of course, it is about balance and, and risk as, associated with that. Um, but what you so, were asking, sorry, sorry, go on in. What you what you were talking about in relation to um, suboptimal iron intake? I mean, I think it's it's a valid point. You know, we we do have a population now that are that are marginal in terms of iron status. And and that's part of the reason for that is the reduction in red meat consumption, which has happened, you know, in the last well actually it's 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 happened the last 50 years really. It's been up and down a bit, but it's the downward trend has been there since about the mid-50s. Um and I think it's it it's a very valid question, you know, how do how do you overcome that? And um I think it's one of the big issues that, that is going to rise even to become even bigger as we see more that more of this transition. Yeah, and there's lots of questions co co coming in, and I've got um, a few more as well, and uh, aligned to that. And you, I, I'm glad that you you, you referenced Ty, Ty's um, um, a paper um, associated with the the Lancet diet and and the deficiencies associated with that diet. What one product which isn't included in that and isn't mentioned is, of course, is is offal. Uh, and the key value that potentially offal can be in terms of micronutrients. And in fact, some a ties one of ties recent papers looked at the value, particularly of offal in terms of micronutrient content. I'm sure Ty will talk about that 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 later. But yeah. what what's your thoughts around increasing offal consumption? Um, well, uh, nutritionally, I think it would be it would be beneficial. I mean, if you take liver, for example, you know, as a a fantastic source of a range of nutrients including iron and vit vitamin uh, vitamin b12 etc but it's it's a, i suppose not it's not for me to to make a judgment on what the population have decided that generally mm -hmm. speaking the population has decided that it doesn't it doesn't like it as much i mean liver consumption has gone down a lot and um, but, but, but then again, red meat consumption has gone down a lot and it has in yeah, the 1950s true. if you look at the uk but absolutely. also across all of you yeah it has yeah absolutely absolutely um, so I think I think you know as as people involved perhaps in nutritional guidelines, then we we should highlight the fact that that there are benefits there could be benefits from these things. It's then up to people to decide, you know, what what they do. And and of course the topic of of this webinar is around our omnivorous diet, and you summarise that so well, of course. And the last thing that ever we ever should do as um, you know scientists working in the livestock sector is is to start put in animal source foods against plant-based foods because ultimately we, we we need them to work together to deliver a healthy diet so have you considered and i i think i asked this question at bsis uh, ian about the complementarity of animal source foods and place but plant-based foods on 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 a plate and how you actually show the value of either or, or both based on the complementarity of nutrients that they provide yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, yeah, I think he did ask the same question. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to give the same answer. Uh, well, I think, but I think it's all down to what I think I referred to as dietary planning. You know, if if you want a diet which meets the nutrient requirements for the for the key nutrients that you have to have, you've almost certainly you've almost certainly got to have a have a, have a blend of both sorts of of food. Now, you people will say, yeah, but what about vegetarians? Well, vegetarians really struggle, and most of the successful vegetarians um, still struggle, but they do work very hard at what they're doing. And, and you've also got to look at the fact that they tend to have, if you look at the BMIs of vegetarians, they tend to be lower. You know, they, they have other aspects of lifestyle which, have, which are beneficial as well. Um, and, and I think they've now got over the vitamin B12 problem because there were vegetarians, I know, some years ago that, that were very uncertain about consuming vitamin, vitamin B12 supplements because 
the, the material was made from using microbial cultures and therefore it was using a living organism if you like um but i think there are now i think most of the b12 are now synthetic so it's probably okay but i think it i think it just comes back to what to what i just said really it comes back to, to sensible dietary planning for most people in most circumstances you will have to have a combination of both plant and animal to achieve balanced diet basically yeah absolutely so we, we are over time for our coffee break so th i'm going to thank you ian and we have got questions which we're going to come to the panel discussion uh, at the end so may i suggest and i'm delighted to see ty has been able to join us from the from the states so i'm going to suggest um uh, colleagues attendees that we have a five minute break uh, for a quick coffee if you've got a coffee machine very nearby or a kettle i think it's the old-fashioned way of doing it um um, or if you want to take a biological break, please do, and we can come past, uh, come back at 25 minutes past um, uh, the hour of whichever hour you're in and from where, which part of the world you're on. So get, get quick five minutes uh, and we'll come back um, uh, for, for Ty's uh, presentation. Thank you. Hey, so welcome back. Um, I hope um, you've had an opportunity to grab a quick coffee. Um, Ty, I, I hope you're there. I can see that uh, you're logged on. If you can um, turn on your... Ty, good to see you. H how's things? It's good. I just made it back in time, dropping off the kids at school. So I was... no, no, no problem at all. So what time is it with you there? It's uh, 8.25. 8.25. That's, that's perfect, isn't it? Perfect time yeah. for you. Yeah. <laughs> Wide awake, we're ready to go. <laughs> um, so, Ty, um, um, we're, we're really looking forward to, to your presentation. Thank you again for, on behalf of the European Federation of Animal Science for agreeing to, to join our, our webinar. Uh, I, I know the times were difficult for you, so we really do appreciate it. Um, so if, if you'd like to share your, your screen um, and, then, and then the floor is yours uh, and then we'll have a panel discussion uh, after your presentation. Sounds good. Thanks, Michael. And I was... Um listening to the conversation in the last 10 minutes, which I found super interesting. So thanks for having me. Um, hello, everyone. I'm going to be talking about something new and something in progress and process. Um, so this is based on a paper uh, that is in review. So just keep that in mind that these are preliminary findings. Um, however, there is a um, there is a preprint already out. So it's not like um, I'm sharing anything that's not available out there. I pasted the link to the preprint in the uh, chat. So I'm going to be talking about a uh, nutrient profiling system called Nutritional Value Score. This is a new uh, system that we've developed. And the reason that we wrote, we um, started working on this was that this is a part of a program that GAIN is working on called Nourishing Food Pathways. And we're really trying to uh, identify nutritious, healthy, and sustainable foods in particular countries so that we can um, kind of inform our program design, you know, which foods are really going to provide the most bang for your buck and can be sustainable as well. So what are nutrient profiling systems? Um, in general, they are food systems, they are systems that rate foods by nutritional value um, or healthfulness using the food composition data. So the components within foods, the dietary attributes to really um, get at what is their health uh, health or nutritional value. And they have many different uses. Uh, in general, they're often used to guide consumer choice, um, food policy, industry reformulations and investments. Uh, they also have other uses to, to guide program design, for example, um, and others. Uh, very popular systems, if you think about Nutri-Score in Europe, uh, HealthStar in Australia, these are very common. Uh, we can even see them on many food labels. Um, others from the scientific literature, which are um, have been very like well referenced, and our um, you know food compass is a bit newer. There's nu nutrient rich foods index, which has been around for a while. Uh, those are pretty common. There are many many others. Uh, I believe there are over a hundred different nutrient profiling systems out there. However, there's really uh, limited documentation on most of these systems. So why should we create a new system? There's a bunch out there. Um, first, we don't really understand all of the different systems out there um, because they haven't been well documented. Um, they haven't been peer reviewed, many of them. Uh, but in general, they're, um, 
there really aren't um, many systems that are designed for global use, especially not in lower income contexts like lower income countries. Uh, there's an issue with bioavailability that hasn't generally been addressed. Um, and that has to do with uh, iron and zinc bioavailability. So differences in the bioavailability of iron and zinc in plant source foods and different animal source foods. Uh, protein and essential amino acids uh, have not really been adjusted for in general in these systems. So protein in a plant source food is generally considered the same as a protein in an animal source food. Energy density um, is, has really been a challenge. So many systems uh, rely on uh, estimating sort of the nutrient density per uh, 100 cal calories or 2000 calories, a fixed fixed quantity of energy. And really, it doesn't um, it doesn't uh, approach the nutrient density from a balanced way because certain foods that are maybe higher in energy density but nutrient dense are are penalized, and then sometimes it can reward foods that have very low energy density, so just low calorie foods that you know to to consume a meaningful amount you would have to consume a kind of unrealistic quantity in terms of mass, and then. And they have not um, specifically been designed for environmental impact assessments uh, like life cycle analysis or for affordability analyses. So we wanted to get um, really uh, at that question of how do we make more nutritionally relevant functional units for these assessments. So what we uh, decided is that we were going to um, design a system uh, specifically for our uh, own use and that we think it could be useful for others working in this um, space. So uh, we developed the nutritional value score, and it's based on six different uh, domains right here. And the first is vitamins. So these are essential vitamins uh, that are typically a concern uh, globally. And so they may not be a concern in every country, but uh, evidence from uh, nutrient supplies, from uh, estimated uh, intake of nutrients, and from biomarkers of deficiency really indicates that these are a challenge in many populations around the world. The same for minerals, there's only five here, but uh, these have been sort of identified as uh, minerals of public health significance. Uh, third category here is nutrient ratios, and so we have the carb to fiber ratio, uh, sodium to potassium, and energy to mass, which is really energy density of the food. And these ratios are really getting at what is the risk to chronic diseases. And so trying to understand the quality of carbohydrates, um, really um, excess sodium when you think about also having low potassium at the same time, and then really energy dense foods. Uh, essential amino acids or the protein category, we really looked at, excuse me, we really looked at the uh, combination of the quantity and the quality of these essential amino acids because we wanted to uh, really discriminate between foods that had different uh, quantity as well as the bioavailability of those amino acids. And then the last two here, we have omega-3, which um, includes uh, long chain omega-3s here, and then also ALA, which I uh, did not include here, but uh, I, I le accidentally left that out. So plant-based omega-3 is also included. And then fiber as a general category, uh, being protective of uh, non-communicable disease. So what are the unique features? Uh, really, we exclusively focused on nutrients of global health priority. So what this does is it really makes the scoring relevant to the health problems that are out there. Uh, oftentimes there's just an inclusion of nutrients because they're essential. So something like phosphorus, where there's actually really, really little um, negligible risk of inadequate phosphorus intake, uh, phosphorus deficiency. At the same time, there can be nutrients like cholesterol that generally um, in the amounts consumed uh, are not really a health, a major health risk that, so we excluded that. We adjust for uh, bioavailability of iron and zinc um, using best estimates um, for average bioavailability, uh, acknowledging that really a lot of factors outside the food also affects bio, bioavailability. We consider the quantity and quality of essential amino acids. Um, we quantify nutrient density in terms of calories and grams. So we're really trying to have a balanced approach that uh, looks at nutrient density and doesn't overly um, favor or penalize foods with high or low energy density um, to, uh, to, to any extreme. And then we also include the subscores. So those uh, boxes on the other slide, all six of those, we have individual scores that kind of show you uh, 
these components because they may be of interest to different stakeholders. So if you're looking for, um, for example, foods that are very high in uh, essential amino acids or protein or how do foods score in terms of omega-3, uh, et cetera, you can actually get those specific scores. And then what is particularly unique is that we tested this on common foods in Indonesia and Bangladesh. And so we wanted to do this because uh, that's our, those are our countries of interest where our programs are, but we also wanted to design something that really works for lower income contexts, so lower and middle income countries. So I'm going to start showing uh, results preliminary for the uh, Indonesia foods. And so we looked at uh, about 100 foods from the diet quality questionnaire from the Global Diet Quality Project. This questionnaire was collected uh, from the Gallup World Poll. And really, uh, we're only including here in this testing the foods that are recommended in uh, dietary guidelines. So we have uh, kind of five categories of, of uh, foods that I'll go through. But the point I want to make here is that these are the two highest scoring foods in this set of 100. So we have spinach and chicken organs. So the highest score you can see in the overall nutritional value score on the right in that dark blue bar is 100 for spinach, 97 for chicken organs. And what I want to highlight is that the actual component scores, even for the top two foods, uh, are not high for all foods, right? They're not all are not high for all categories. So for spinach, the omega-3 score is, is quite low, 24. Um, essential amino acids score is just 45, whereas for, for chicken organs, that score is about 83. Um, and so the point here is just that you can have a food that really is the top of the charts, but it's still not going to meet all of the sort of dietary attributes that are important for health. So it really uh, highlights the importance of combining foods, which I'll get into more. Okay, so now I'm going to look at some of the um, results for the um, overall score. So this is the nutritional value score. And this is the aggregate score that I mentioned with those different uh, six different dietary attribute domains. So what we can see here is we're looking at um, foods recommended across dietary guidelines globally, and there are five common food groups. So these are fruits, you know, vegetables, legumes, nuts, and seeds, animal source foods, and starchy staples. And at the top, we see a lot of the, um, I didn't show all of the foods in this figure, but uh, the dark leafy greens score highly, uh, of course, organ meats, um, and then some of the fish and shellfish and, and legumes and seeds as well and then some other animal source foods. So we have a kind of a range of foods with the lower scoring, scoring foods here, congee, which is like a, a rice-based dish that has uh, mostly just white rice and, and quite a bit of sodium, and then watermelon and, and, and rice, that mix of brown and white. So we can kind of see the range of nutritional value scores across these foods. Now, when we're looking uh, within a food group, it's particularly useful because uh, for many different reasons, either for uh, uh, policies or programs, uh, Usually recommended recommendations do not specify which types of vegetables um, um, to, a, to a large extent, sometimes they do, but in general it's, you know, consume 400 grams of fruits and vegetables. Uh, we really want to identify the most nutritious or nutrient dense um, or uh, fiber rich or protective against uh, communicable diseases. So there is quite a range. So if you think of something like spinach, a dark green leafy vegetable, it's highly nutrient dense, also has um, quite a bit of fiber compared to something like eggplant or cucumber. There's actually quite uh, more nutritional value in the spinach, so we're actually capturing that. So you can see um, it takes really uh, about three times the amount of eggplant or cucumber to provide a similar nutritional value of spinach. When we look at the fruits category, uh, we see a bit of variation, not quite as much, but um, still a large variation. Uh, rose apple, which is quite high in fiber and other um, compounds that are beneficial, guava, for example, scoring pretty high. And at the bottom, you have watermelon. So uh, certain systems like Food Compass would score, um, you know, watermelon the same as kale, for example. And uh, here we're really discriminating the nutritional value of that based on the carbohydrate quality, the amount of water in the food, that, uh, the, the nutrient density as well. Now, when we look at the category of legumes, nuts, and seeds, uh, most of these score higher in general. Well, there's not as many low scoring. So in general, these are pretty nutrient rich um, protective food group. The higher scoring um, foods are seeds and, and some of the soybeans and, and other uh, legumes. For animal source foods, there's a, there's a big range. 
uh, unsurprisingly, the, the organ meats scoring at the top and then some of the lean ruminant meats and fish and shellfish. And at the bottom is a little bit less nutrient dense foods. We have duck, which is more of a, a fatty uh, food in the, um, in the Indonesian context here. For starcher staples, these score lower, lower in general, um, but we still see quite a range. So some of these uh, foods like sweet potato can score quite high at 49, uh, which is a decent score even on the overall uh, scoring across food groups. And others like kanja, cassava scoring quite low. So these findings are useful for nutrition, but they're also designed um, specifically for life cycle analysis. Uh, and what life cycle analysis is, it's really trying to understand the environmental impact of foods from the, uh, the entire life cycle of production uh, to consumption and disposal. And the common functional unit used is usually something fixed, like a, a fixed uh, one uh, quantity of mass of so one kilogram or quantity of energy, a thousand calories, or sometimes a uh, you know, fixed quantity of protein, but again, not adjusting typically for the quality of that protein. So. We uh, really wanted to design a more nutritionally relevant functional unit so that we can get a sense of what's the environmental impact per unit nutritional value, which is much more relevant for um, the health of populations. So what this figure is showing is that you know, we're standardizing for a nutritional value score of 100. And so what that means is that uh, we're estimating here on the x-axis the amount of grams or the mass of the food required to provide a similar nutritional value score of 100. So we can see here again spinach um, having about 231 grams to provide a nutritional value score, whereas cucumber in the same food group requiring almost three times uh, as many grams. And so you can see the range of how this can actually influence the uh, environmental impact assessments on orders of magnitude. Um, so we can go anywhere from kanji being well above 2000 down to spinach, which is just a couple hundred. So we have done some initial testing in this um, paper. We've uh, assessed content validity, really, including dietary attributes of global health priority, uh, looking at the, the latest evidence that we have. Um, we assess face validity, which is really how well does this appear to um, to really make sense at face value, implementing the algorithm across these local foods in Indonesia and Bangladesh. I was showing here just the results for Indonesia, but we also have them for Bangladesh in the supplemental material. We've also done a series of sensitivity analyses to test the robustness and assumptions in the algorithm. So. We have used different component weights. So in those six categories, we have uh, you know, shifted the weights to uh, something that may be more protective of non-communicable diseases, really favoring the fiber, the omega-3, and the nutrient ratios. And we have also done the same thing, found it kind of favoring essential nutrient density. So increasing scores for the, in increasing the weights for the essential nutrients. We've also done um, some different assumptions on micronutrient capping. So the, the um, initial system, the main system really uses uh, a quantity of about 231 grams as a, as a the, the fixed portion size that we're assessing, uh, which is um, and 300 calories. And we're capping the uh, recommended nutrient intakes uh, at 100% at of those recommendations so that a food that's very high in one nutrient, let's say carrots and vitamin A, are not overly rewarded. So that we're kind of favoring foods that have a balance of nutrients, which has um, there's kind of reasons to con consume foods like that. So you, you have, you're actually, actually absorbing more of the nutrients. And then uh, for this sensitivity analysis, we cut the uh, capping down to 50% and up to 200%. So we really see how that adjusts the scores and it has an influence. Winds arising is just essentially uh, truncating the uh, high, the the outliers, so the upper and lower 95% um, um, confidence intervals, really, we are truncating. So what it does is it kind of shows any of the foods that are that are towards the top kind of score similarly at the top score, any foods towards the bottom score similarly towards the bottom score. So this is done, uh, Food Compass has used this approach and they had a much larger set of foods in their initial testing of like over 8,000. So we only had 100 and uh, we really chose to keep the, the, the main analysis because 
it helps us distinguish between those foods that um, really do have different nutritional value. We didn't want to um, truncate and assume that the foods um, that score, you know, close to those different confidence intervals could actually be the same. So in the future, uh, we really suggest that this uh, approach is adapted and applied to a broader range of foods because uh, then it can also be tested uh, and assessed for criterion valid validity. So this can be done through epidemiology um, and randomized controlled trials to really um, eliminate the potential confounding in epidemiology. And then uh, what we're working on currently is using this nutrition value score to assess environmental impacts in Indonesia and Bangladesh. And we are also assessing um, affordability of foods in a, a set of countries uh, as well, using this as the, the main unit of analysis. So I have a couple of slides of con conclusions and I've made some conclusions about the system itself and then relevant to this uh, webinar on omnivorous diets. So the nutritional value really varies across recommended foods. Uh, this is not always captured in recommendations, so we want to uh, really be able to highlight those uh, differences and the nutritional value score helps us identify foods with high nutritional value within and across food groups. The, the main sort of foods that we find that are the highest in nutritional value at the top are dark green leafy vegetables and organ meats, and then we have fish and shellfish. Um, other vegetables like broccoli, uh, we have seeds legumes, um, particularly the soy, um, soybeans, other animal source foods, and then certain fruits like guava, rose apple, and then starchy staples like sweet potato can actually score quite high as well. But no food scores high across all dietary attributes. So we saw that in one of the early slides with spinach and uh, chicken organs. Even if they have the top score, they're not high in all areas. So we really need a mix of those different types of foods that can fill the, the dietary gaps. Uh, and what that shows really the importance of plant source foods and animal source foods working together. They have complementary nutritional profiles. And uh, when you get too low on either, you actually increase risk for inadequate diets. So the nutritional value score can also enable more nutritionally relevant and meaningful comparisons for environmental impact and affordability assessments, as I discussed at the end. That's really important to try to standardize for nutrition rather than just an, an arbitrary at mass uh, when we know that there's quite a difference in nutritional value across foods. So I'm going to leave it there, but also have hopefully have some time for questions. And if you if you would like to send an email, I'm happy to. Uh, respond as well when I get a chance. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Ty. And I really, really appreciate you giving um, EAAP a first snapshot of this uh, new assessment score. Uh, there are some really good, great questions in in, in the chat. Um, I'll take Chairman's prerogative, if I may, with the first one. Um, this assessment really cries out to me about the opportunities for complementarity. So when you're looking at different types of foods um, and optimizing diets based on nutritional value. So have, have you used or think of applying this to how possibly an app um, which could suggest which foods complement best other types of foods to ensure that you have the best nutritional profile as part of a diet? That's a good question. You know, we haven't, um, we haven't consider that yet. Um, there's a lot of other priorities that are based on programmatic needs um, where the, the funding has been. But I think um, that's important, um, really considering the total diet. Um, and these this the way this is set up is that it can assess any type of, it could assess a meal as well. But it's not really, um, we haven't thought about trying to help people be able to come kind of combine foods to make the, the highest score. But that is something that could be considered in future work if there's um, kind of interest in funding to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, um, maybe, maybe we, we, we follow up afterwards, but clearly when you look at those patterns, if you look at the histograms, you can see how that can be mapped to, to, to look at the uh, optimum uh, combination of diff different, different foods. Yeah. Um, th thank you, Ty. Um, so there's a few questions in the chat. First one, um, which I'm, I'm sure you've been asked previously, you, you looked at the omega-3 balances. What, why didn't you include DPA um, in, in that list of, of, of omega-3s? 
why why did we include dpa no, why didn't you we did you did so yeah you, you saw dha and epa uh but often dpa is missed but you, you yes did you're right we, that is often missed we did include it um okay and it's not always available but again we use the we use the usda um food composition data to sub for most of the food uh, you know many of the foods in the certain compounds so we did use that and i think that's a limitation of other systems that they don't include dpa um so yeah that's i think uh something that's unique about this here um would you like me to answer the other questions too for yes yes please yeah if you can see them in the chat one from leslie and and hans van down i don't know if you can see the question i'm happy to to read them to you i, yeah. I suppose the, the key thing about dpa as you rightly said so if i misconstrued the question is it, it's often not uh, uh, analyzed and assessed and therefore it's not included in in, in, in databases but it's great that you include it so the question from leslie uh, mitchell um relates to um uh, can you use the NVS to be, for particular regions or country demographic needs due to, i.e., differences between country? Uh, can can this be tailored? I think you start to address that question in 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 your talk. Yeah, so that's a great question. It's actually very important. Um, we have an, our initial work has been focused in Indonesia and Bangladesh, and that's to inform our programs there. Um, however, we have another piece of work that we're considering starting next year where we are going to really assess the um, nutritional status of regions. So I'm thinking of Latin America, South, South Asia, and maybe Sub-Saharan Africa, and really understanding what is what are the nutritional problems, challenges, needs in these regions, uh, so that we can tailor the, uh, the weights of the different domains. So for example, in a population that has a very high prevalence and burden of undernutrition, of nutrient deficiencies, we, we want to really pay attention to that, or if, if you know, essential amino acids are, are lacking. And if it's in uh, a region where there's a quite, quite more of a concern of the uh, obesity and non-communicable diseases, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera, then we would want to consider those factors more. So we are absolutely starting, uh, intending to do that next year. And uh, in terms of the population groups that you're absolutely right too, we, we base the recommended nutrient intakes on um, sort of an overall population, but we are um, planning to tailor this for populations that have increased needs. So for women of reproductive age, for example, we really want to design it. And what that will do is that it'll highlight, OK, if the recommended intakes of iron are quite a bit higher, then we're actually going to um, iron could be weighted heavy, more um, more heavily in the analysis. And so that really can tailor the um, the design of the algorithm and the, the metric that is rating foods based on those needs. If I can paraphrase the next question from Hans van Dam, because I think you, you, you've already addressed some of the questions about dietary uh, assessment instead of individual um, food items. Um, but as, as Hans has indicated, it, it's quite complex for the consumer already. And if we move away from the simplicity of defining fresh fruit and vegetables, animal source foods, to something more about a nutritional value score, so how, how do you how do you assume that this will be included and, and used within the sector and, and used particularly for the consumer? Yeah, that's a good question, too. Uh, we don't intend to use this for the consumer at all. So we're not recommending any type of uh, front of package labeling, anything like that. So contrary to the common uses of uh, many of the common uses of nutrient profiling systems, we're actually cautioning against that. And the reason is, I think, just as you stated here, it's not. Um, we don't really want to put that on the consumers to try to figure out, oh, now I, it's going to be even more complicated. Instead of just consume fruits and vegetables, you need to consume the right ones. We don't want to make things harder. Uh, this is really to be informed for um, program design, to be able to target foods that are going to be the highest nutritional value um, and lowest environmental impact. It's for policies, so we can really maybe incentivize um, policies that really favor some of these more nutritious foods. And then it can also be for researchers so that we can use more nutritionally meaningful uh, functional units in different type of assessments. The one way that I think it could potentially be used for consumers, uh, some food-based dietary guidelines at the national level actually get into some environmental impact of foods, for example. And if, if a country is doing that, it's not, it's pretty crude to try to say, don't, don't consume or, or you know favor just these these broad food groups 
So what what it could do is that if the you know the environmental impact is is sort of assessed at a country level within a food group, it could kind of show for people who may be interested that there are lower impact um, foods within that category at least. So you're you're kind of keeping it within a food group, like like for example, if you have uh, vegetables or fruits, or if you have animal source foods, you can look at that. Now that could be of course um, problematic. So I'm not necessarily sure that's going to be a common. Uh, use but there is at least some potential of that to help kind of distinguish within a food group that's recommended we know it's important for health uh how do you identify the the most uh sustainable foods in that context so if if the if those analyses are done using local data and they're kind of a balanced approach that could be potentially useful yeah that's great thank you very much ty um if i'll, I'll give you one more question I'll, I'll ask ian and drew to join us back then um a question was asked, have you used, have you tried this approach on the Eat Lancet diet? So have you used the NVS score associated with the recommendations for that to see how, what, what comes out? We haven't. And, and one of the challenges with using this is that there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of data points that you need to compile for the food composition data. So it's not as simple as taking a database that's out there. You have to build it. Um, and so we haven't. Uh, however, um, it could be done. You could use, uh, certainly, you know, in our paper on the kind of assessing the adequacy of the Eat Lancet diet, we did that for six micronutrients. Um, so it could be done. It would just sort of take the, the labor of putting those, the, that food composition data together. I think that would be very interesting to test. And also you could look at, certainly you could look at the scores within the different recommendations as well. So I think that'd be interesting. Um, there, I will caveat that the the way the nutritional value score is currently designed has been for foods that are recommended that in dietary guidelines. So we have these fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts and seeds, animal source foods, and starchy staples. They're all minimally processed. We have not designed it to where um, and tested it on foods like uh, oils, fats, and oils. Yes. Now most of them would score quite low. But we know something, you know, something like olive oil, which which can have health benefits, uh, would not necessarily be captured in this. So there would need to be some tailoring of the approach, um, and so that's that would be like a future step. So at this point, um, now in terms of foods, so at least if it was expanded as is to foods like ultra processed foods, I actually think it will score. Um, it'll it'll do quite well because the components in those uh, ultra processed foods. Have some commonalities so they're often energy dense so that would be penalized in the score they're often nutrient poor even if a food is fortified so let's say you have some fortified ultra processed foods uh, they're usually not fortified in all of the nutrients of public health concern there's they're rarely fortified in essential amino acids or omega-3 so that'll be pick, picked up in our in our algorithm the carbohydrate quality if you look at the uh ref, you know carbs to fiber ratio that's usually um, a problem in ultra processed foods and then the sodium to potassium ratio is is very often a problem you have high sodium and low potassium so i think it would very um it would it would distinguish the healthfulness of ultra processed foods quite well of course we haven't tested it yet because that's a whole nother challenge of of uh, designing the data finding the data for the actual um food composition of those um, different foods but i think it's a really interesting question that could be explored in the future that's great. Thank you very much, Ty. So if I ask Ian and Drew to join us back, um, we haven't got long left, um, but uh, it's great to see all uh, the panelists together on, on one screen. Um, there are, Ian, good to see you. So so before we, I ask you each of you just to summarize, um, you know, your view on the key title of the webinar is that you know sustaining human and planetary health through a balanced omnivorous diet i was wondering if any of the panelists had questions for each other uh, because often this happens you, you're on a panel um and you're dying to ask a question to, to one of the other speakers and you're not given the opportunity so so if any of you have a question for any any of the other speakers that then, then please that now, now's your opportunity i i kind of have a question for, for ty i guess um I mean, I think the way he's described the the, the the scoring system sounds to me the sort of thing that a lot of people have been looking for for ages in terms of trying to bring in a system which adequately compares different foods in terms of their environmental impact. 
and I, and I think to, for me that's you know one of the it seems to be a great step forward which is which has not happened yet until until this because everything so far is now just compared per kilogram of this or per, per gram or whatever and um I just hope that this is able to I just hope it's able to kind of you know deal with the the inadequacies of that system really but my I suppose my question was and I perhaps missed it when I when when he was saying I just wondered whether the the the, the scoring system that you use includes is it just based on nutrient composition or does it include some elements of functionality as well I mean for example does it include things like glycemic index when you're comparing carbohydrate types or or does it include other functionalities that we know some proteins have that you can't necessarily describe in terms of traditional protein mm -hmm. quality scores if you know what I mean that would yeah be it's, it, it is based entirely on food composition so we don't look at other factors. For example, uh, we know there are benefits of um, you know fermented foods like uh, fermented dairy products, and and we are not able to capture that currently because um, you know there there isn't food composition data generally that that indicates that you could you could manually go in and do that. Um, but it but it does capture things like risk for. Um, you know, it does capture foods in terms of the glycemic index, even though not directly, because it's the, the carb to fiber ratio. Yeah. And fiber is also scored as a separate component. Yeah. Um, and then, and, you know, energy density and then protein, you know, essential amino acid quantity and quality. So it does, it does actually um, score foods that have a high glycemic index lower. You can see that in glycemic load. You can see that in the fruits category and the starchy staples where those foods like watermelon um, and you know some of the like kanji or the, the white rice score quite low and that's the reason so it is capturing um, many of those things but of course there's some limitations with the um, what can you do with the data you have and there's always this challenge of complexity versus simplicity where in from a scientific perspective it's you can probably get a better score using more complexity but the reality is that the data situation doesn't really enable that in in many contexts and that's this, this challenge you know how do you actually design something that can be useful and and that's a trade-off i don't know how to avoid that at this point now there's always trade-offs <laughs> yeah there is and i was going to end you know and jude emphasizes it so well um sustainability is extremely complicated here we've been talking about nutritional aspects uh, and their inclusion, their vital inclusion within sustainability. Well, obviously, we're talking about food systems, but you, you can you can balance that against environmental impact, biodiversity, social acceptance, social support mechanisms. You know, women empowerment, all these different things which are associated with food, um, and, it, and it really, really uh, emphasizes the complexity. We talked about alcohol. Um, being, you know, you know, a higher risk in terms of um, of, of of cancer than than um, um, animal source foods, but also alcohol has, has benefits in terms of um, um, me mental health, but also has risks associated, of course, with with, with mental health, and so all, all those things need to be considered. I'm going to leave the last word to Jude if you have any questions um, or or comments. Um, and then and then I'll wrap up because we, we are running over slightly and I've noticed that some participants had to, uh, had to leave the webinar. Uh, but Jude, if you have any last comments or thoughts, uh, I just hand over to you. Uh, no questions, but just to echo the complexity and the difficulty of finding a metric. I think that's that's the thing we've all been grappling with ever since, you know, greenhouse gas emissions became a sort of publicly thought about thing in about 2006 with the Livestock's Long Shadow Report. It is such a complex issue and it's so difficult to find a metric that adequately encompasses all those complexities and i think we just need to try and make as much progress as we can towards that as you say that encompasses all of those different things um and even then we'll find something else that we need to look at as well like antibiotic resistance for example so yeah hugely complex and i've just seen a um a, a comment or a, or a q a about the global farm metric which is what i was trying to think of when i answered a question earlier about things where we look at 
lots of different um, aspects. The global farm metric is trying to do exactly that, looking at lots of different sustainability aspects. So, yeah. Thank you, Jude. And, uh, and aligned to that, I'd ask, you know, invite individuals to look at the Dublin Declaration and the suite of scientific papers uh, supporting the Dublin Declaration of the role of animal source foods in sustainable diets. And there's, there's papers specifically looking at those, those new nuances and the complexity of environmental um, impact assessors um, and, and how, how we can deal with that level of complexity with something as um, important as, as nutritional um, health and planetary health, of course. So the last thing uh, I just want to do is, uh, is, is to thank all our, our speakers. Ty, really grateful at the start of your day. Jude and Ian at the beginning or the, the middle of your day. Um, and uh, thank you all very much uh, for your uh, excellent presentations and discussion. Thank you to all the attendees. And please remember uh, your support for uh, the European Federation of Animal Science and our next annual meeting in Florence. And I look forward to seeing all the abstracts submitted and seeing you at that meeting. And um, thank you again uh, for, for your attendance and, and the discussion. So thank you all. Oh, sorry, there was, there was one last question. Is the, are these presentations going to be available? Yes, this has been recorded and it will be on the European Federation of Animal Science, EAAP's website, uh, as with all the other webinars by EAP. So thank you all very much. <laughs>